Welcome to Hope at Night. Featuring Harvey Alvarez, Ty Gibson, Q&A with our live audience, and host Anil Kanda. Today's episode, Will AI Make Humans Obsolete? And here's your host, Anil Kanda. Hello and good evening. Welcome to Hope at Night. People have lots of scenarios about the end of the world. Recently, well-known tech influencers have begun to announce a warning about AI or artificial intelligence. Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla, shared on a podcast recently that AI could bring about what he termed civilization disaster. In addition, government officials have begun to discuss restraints on the rapidly growing technology. Could AI take over the world? Could we develop artificial intelligence so advanced it makes humanity obsolete? What does it mean to really be human? To help us better understand this question, we've invited Harvey Alvarez, a professor and director for the Center of Innovation and Research of Computer Science. Please give Harvey Alvarez a Hope at Night welcome. Dr. Alvarez, I've got to start off. I've got to ask you this question. Are we going to see real life Terminators take over the world and destroy humanity? <laughs> there are several unknowns about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is not something new. In fact, this concept of artificial intelligence was formalized in the 1950s. However, in the last years, we have seen an explosion about different applications of artificial intelligence to different areas of knowledge. Um, so, of course, there are dangers with artificial intelligence. Uh, let's see, for example, if we use artificial intelligence in weapons. So, are these weapons going to destroy by themselves some targets? How are they going to make decisions about what to do? Yeah? What uh, ethics do they have? Yeah, what ethics should they have? Um, at the end, uh, humans are, are in charge of training the models, artificial intelligence models, and to look for the data, to clean up the data, and to use this data to create these models of artificial intelligence to do this kind of uh, weapons, for example. So uh, let's blame the humans, you know, <laughs> for, for any actions, wrong actions of artificial intelligence. Uh, Dr. Alvarez, uh, what, what is your background? Why is it that you do know so much about artificial intelligence and technology? I have a PhD in computer science. I have worked on artificial intelligence and autonomous systems for several years. I have several publications in peer-reviewed journals uh, in the area of uh, medicine 4.0. So it is about the application of artificial intelligence to medicine. I have worked with my students on autonomous vehicles, um, a smart agriculture, a analysis of geochemical data using uh, machine learning, which is a soft field of artificial intelligence. So yeah, this is what I do, what I teach to my students. Could you break down for us, in layman's term, what exactly is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is a way to make machines and software intelligent. Of course, we don't know the full structure and functionality of the brain, but at least we know that we have neurons and we have connections among these neurons. So this is what we try to imitate in, in machines, okay, in artificial intelligence. So for example, we have our virtual co cortex and there are different layers uh, in this cortex. So we imitate that in something called deep neural networks that try to imitate the basic structure and functionality of the brain. However, the brain is a mystery. We don't know <laughs> so much about the brain, and maybe we will never understand, fully understand the brain, its functionality, uh, why we dream, imagination, creativity. Yeah, these are kind of things that machines do not have, but we have them, and these kind of things make us special and different from machines. Uh, what would you say are some good things about artificial intelligence? 
Artificial intelligence is a key component of the fourth industrial revolution. We live in the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, in this revolution, we have big data. We have very powerful computing power. Yeah, uh, machines that we can use to train these models, artificial intelligence models. So right now we have everything to do great things with artificial intelligence. As I already mentioned, we can use it, for example, uh, to in medicine. Yeah, for instance, uh, with my students, we have used it to uh, diagnose uh, skin cancer or to detect glaucoma or difficult airway. So these are ways in which we can use artificial intelligence for good. Yeah, but uh, we also have to be very careful about the problems that artificial intelligence can bring to humanity. Right. L you know, uh, before we go there, yeah. I have um, some friends who are in the medical profession, yeah. and, and they've already started to use, you know, you have chat GPT. You've got the medical version of that where you can you type in any issue, any problem. Here is the diagnosis. Here is what we believe is the cure. Literally, this thing is advancing medical research as we know it. Yes, yes, we can save a lot of time. We can be less error prone. Um, the idea, and let me be positive about artificial intelligence, is to work together with artificial intelligence. Uh, is not to say that artificial intelligence will replace us. Of course, there are going to be jobs that uh, unfortunately are going to disappear because of artificial intelligence. But we need to recognize the power of artificial intelligence and work together with artificial intelligence in different professions. Right, so, and, and, and this is really fascinating, we're already starting to see a shift where uh, human workers are being replaced by uh, automated technology and, and other technology. What would you say are some of the, the cons, some of the sort of negative effects, possible negative effects of, of AI technology? It is estimated that around the 25% of jobs, current jobs are going to disappear because of artificial intelligence. So this is something that we need to work on. Uh, governments need to create a stronger policies. Um, and the other issue is that most of the development of artificial intelligence is concentrated in a few companies, corporations. Um, but what about the rest of the world? So currently we have a big technological gap in the world. Some countries, some corporations, that know too much about artificial intelligence, but so many other people in the world who do not even have access to a computer, to the internet. So you see, uh, there is a big gap, and with artificial intelligence, this gap can become bigger and bigger and bigger. So if we talk about uh, ethics in artificial intelligence, we, we need a, a strong framework, ethical framework, to decide what is right, what is wrong in arti with artificial intelligence. And I do believe, as a Christian, that the Bible has an answer for that. You know, the golden rule. The golden rule says, do to others what you want them to do to you. So if we apply that principle, not just to artificial intelligence, but to any area of development of uh, technology, so we can be more uh, ethical and how to create technology for the common good. Right, and, and in fact, we're not just seeing organization, um, corporations, we're now seeing criminal elements utilize AI technology. Yeah. Uh, what's been any of your exposure to that? Uh, yes, I have studied that, um, that uh, situation. For example, in the case of deep fakes or fake news, um, so there is danger because, for, for instance, if, we, if you have an artificial intelligence model that auto-generates texts, <laughs> you know, fake texts about news and just distributes these texts in different social media uh, sites and so on, so people will be distracted about the reality. You're potentially swaying public opinion by, you know, uh, bringing out particular sort of ideas and agendas through these bots. Yeah, yeah. and uh, this is about controlling minds. So um, that's why um, 
I highlight this need to have a stronger policies uh, and also a strong ethical framework to build and to apply artificial intelligence. Would you say that uh, big corporations are, are bringing this into the formula, the, the idea of ethics and, and just a responsibility? Some of them are doing things, yeah, in that area. However, um, there is, we need more commonalities, mm. you know, in common, a common ground in terms of how we are going to, and how we need to develop uh, this kind of artificial intelligence nowadays. Otherwise, it can become dangerous. And especially, you know, when we see that there are models, artificial intelligence models, uh, for example, in the case of generative uh, models, these models that take a big amount of textual data to generate new texts, for example, in the case of ChatGPT, uh, By the way, can you explain exactly for some people who may not know yet what chat GPT is? Basically what they did was to take uh, a lot of text from the web yeah, and use this text to create a model and this model auto-generates new texts. Yeah, so this is something very new. Uh, in the area of artificial intelligence, we have been doing things in that area for a long while. This is in an area called natural language processing. However, the difference with ChatGPT, for example, is that first they made it public. Yeah, everyone can use it free of charge. And secondly, uh, they had this partnership with Microsoft yeah, to, um, to use their infrastructure, computing infrastructure, to create these models. It is so expensive <laughs> to create such a model uh, because it requires a lot of computing power, a lot of electricity, um, and it's very difficult that, let's say, in your lab, <laughs> you have all this power. That's why these kind of partnerships, partnerships are important in order to generate these new kinds of, of development. Okay, fascinating, fascinating. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this. How close do you think AI can come to humanity? Mm, that's a great question. I mean, we're, we're, uh, there are, <laughs> some of us may not be realizing we're interacting with artificial intelligence. Uh, maybe someone who we talk to, customer service, this stuff is becoming more and more advanced and it's yeah. mimicking human beings very well. Uh, there's been recent um, Google events where, where they displayed how um, someone was calling in for a yeah. pizza or ordering some Chinese yeah. and the AI was uh, seamlessly yeah. just navigating through that. Correct. And, and the person on the other end didn't know what was going on. They, they just thought this was a human they were talking to. Yeah, there are several differences between humans and machines. We have free will. We have a conscience, we have consciousness, uh, we have emotions, we can fall in love. We have this need of have relationships with others. Right. Machines do not have that. They don't imagine, they don't dream, they don't think about eternal life. What will happen after I die? You know, these are the kind of questions that machines do not have. Right. We as humans, According to the Christian perspective, Christian worldview, we have been created by God. And it makes us special. We have an special identity. And secondly, Jesus Christ came, God himself came to die for us. So it makes us so special, sons and daughters of God. And when you have this personal experience with God, this is amazing, and you have a purpose for your life. Machines do not have these kind of things. Mm. Let, me, let me throw this out. Can AI mm -hmm. think about religious things, spiritual things? I mean, I've heard recently there are some pastors that are letting AI write their sermons for them. Yes. Uh, yeah. Is the Holy Spirit working through that? <laughs> what would you say? If you get data, any kind of data, and you, and you train a model with this data, you are going to get results from this data. So let's say that I get the Bible in text and I use it as an input for my, to generate my artificial intelligence model. So if I ask questions to this model, so the model will answer these questions. Tell me about the creation of the world. It will give me answers according to the Bible and so on. So 
Uh, we may say that artificial intelligence in that sense is like an intelligent parrot, yeah? We put input data and it generates results according to this data. Um, but religion is not just about uh, theoretical knowledge. knowledge. Mm. It is about experimental knowledge, mm. yeah? Uh, and it is about, you know, we as humans, we are spiritual beings. According to the Bible, uh, there is an equation. We as human beings have been created with this hardware, yeah, the body, yeah, the dust of the earth, plus the breath of God equals human being. Yeah, this is the equation of right. life. Right. You can have a machine, and some people, for example, in the area of the singularity, for example, Ray Kurzweil, which is a very famous author, he believes that in the future, we will be able to put our conscience, our consciousness, our memories, imagination, everything in a thumb drive, <laughs> and then inject it into a machine. And then this machine can live forever. And he has a book called The Age of Spiritual Machines, mm. because his argument is that machines will have, will, will be like living, th living things, living beings. However, according to the Christian worldview, biblical worldview, that is contrary, you know, to, to what, right. for example, what I believe as a Christian, because uh, you cannot have a living being without the breath of God, yeah? And this is an spiritualistic view. Uh, you know, according to the Bible, uh, all of us are sinners, so we deserve to die. So the idea with the singularity, which is the next step, in artificial intelligence. By the way, the singularity, is, is that the point of no return? Is that the point where we reach, where it's like, we're not going back from that? We are not going back. Uh, before we go back, have <laughs> we reached that point? No. Okay. No. When will we know we reach that point? <laughs> That's a great I'm question. I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. So let me tell you about the process in the evolution of artificial intelligence. So far, we have been working on weak AI. Weak AI is about the application of artificial intelligence to particular areas of knowledge. So for example, I create an artificial intelligent model to uh, drive an autonomous vehicle. I create another model to play chess, different models to do different things. The next step in the evolution of artificial intelligence is called a strong AI. The idea with strong, strong AI, strong AI okay. is to have just one model just like in our brain, we have one model, and this model is able to solve any problem with just one model. A kind of super intelligence? Super intelligence, so to, uh, to reach the level of intelligence of humans. And some people believe that just after we have reached this point of a strong AI, the next step will be the singularity, which is an explosion of intelligence that we have never imagined before. The idea with the singularity is that it will be a combination of hardware, yeah, machines, and humans, you know, like, as I already mentioned, let's say you put your memories, you put your thoughts and everything into this machine. Kind of merging. Yeah, like with biotechnology, yeah, uh, emerging, and of course with artificial intelligence, you try to imitate yourself. So it is a way of trying to look for eternal life without the need of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a techno-humanist way of, of seeing things. It is, it is about post-humanism. In fact, Yuval Noah Harari, he's a very famous author. He's the author of a book called Homo Deus. Um, it is about his arguments about how he thinks the world will be. Uh, he thinks that Homo sapiens will be not enough <laughs> in the near future. You know, according to the theory of evolution, Homo sapiens came after all these billions of years, you know, so Homo sapiens, but Homo sapiens is not enough because we die, is towards Homo Deus, is towards the singularity. It's about avoiding a death by our own means. Dr. Alfrez, this has been an amazing and yet terrifying <laughs> conversation I've had with you. And I'm, I'm really excited because we're going to be talking about some more stuff right after this. We've been talking with professor and computer science researcher, Dr. Harvey Alfrez, on the future of artificial intelligence. Does AI threaten to put an end to the usefulness and value of humans? 
We'll be continuing the conversation with our next guest after the break, so don't go away. Welcome back to Hope at Night. So we've entered the AI phase of technological development. Uh, we've been talking with professor and computer science researcher, Dr. Harvey Alvarez on the future of artificial intelligence. But will AI put an end to the usefulness and the value of human beings? That is something popular speaker and author Ty Gibson has thought a lot about. And he's here to share those thoughts with us. Please welcome to Hope at Night, Ty Gibson. Hi, welcome. Glad you're here. Yeah. Excellent. Good to be here. Harvey. Hi. <laughs> uh, Ty. Anil. Just a few months ago. Yeah. Uh, there was some news that was making headlines. Google put on leave one of their programmers mm. because the programmer claimed that a bot he was developing uh, was developing the ability to think it was becoming intelligent far beyond what mm. anyone was imagining. Mm. It was becoming sentient. Mm. It began to think and dis display communication ability regarding religious things. Mm. Mm. Ty, do you think robots can be saved? <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely certain they cannot. <laughs> what do you think makes this ultimately different uh, than, in, than technology? Well, can I go all the way back to the year 1818? Feel free to. To just set the stage for, for this particular part of our discussion. Um, in 1818, Mary Shelley, at the young age of just 18 years old, wrote a book that has gone down in history as one of the most famous works of literature. And that book, of course, is Frankenstein. Frankenstein is in popular thought regarded as something like a horror story, and it's been turned into horror movies, right? But the underlying concept of that book, that story, is really, can human beings create systems more powerful than themselves mm. so that they can't control what they have created and unleashed upon the world? So in the story, Dr. Frankenstein creates a monster in quote marks, and then the monster turns out to be physically more powerful than the doctor or any human being, and the rest of the story has the doctor running around the countryside trying to kill the monster he created, right? So human beings do actually have the capacity to create systems that are outside of their own control. And the reason for this, I believe, is that our moral maturity does not match our intellectual maturity. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we can create technologies that we don't have the moral maturity to govern right. or to deal with. So for example, think of uh, the development of nuclear energy. I mean, this is something that can go in one of two directions. The atomic bomb was developed, right? We came right up, human beings literally came right up to the point where through mathematical equations, we could create technologies that could destroy the world and we had the question, should we go ahead and create it? And our answer was yes. Right. Let's go ahead and create a technology that could destroy the world. And I believe that, that AI is that level of technology. I think it has pros and cons. What um, would you say are some of the pros and cons? Well, one of the pros is that, and I did this, you can say to AI, could you please write a beautiful poem for my wife? And it will. <laughs> now, I didn't give that poem to my wife because I didn't write it, but I was testing it. I was, was it good, by the way? It was a good poem. <laughs> <laughs> I asked it to write a Christian song, for example, with the theme of water and, and the cross and it wrote a really good song. I asked it to write a 400 word essay on the impact of Sigmund Freud's psychotherapy ideas on modern advertising industry. And it wrote that essay in three seconds. Wow. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so there are positive aspects of it. Um, I think it's going to be good to free up the human spirit 
to pursue creative courses in life so that we're not merely eking out a living by doing um, the work that we have to do, but at the same time, as you mentioned Harari, for example, mm -hmm. um, Yoel Harari um, wrote an article not too long ago called The Rise of the Useless Class. Now that's mm -hmm. a pretty chilling title for an article. Right. The Rise of the Useless Class. <laughs> and he essentially poses the question, he says that the single most important question for 20th, 21st century thinkers is, what are we going to do with all the useless humans? that wow. AI will inevitably create. And then he gives a list of all, you mentioned, the different jobs and professions mm -hmm. that, that will be done better by the combination of AI and robotics technology. So you bring those two things together and it's inevitable, Harari says, for example, that, that a machine, a robot, uh, combined with AI will be able to do a more flawless open heart surgery than a human surgeon. Mm -hmm. So it, ine it's inevitable that it will become, at some point, illegal for a human being to even perform a surgery because AI can do it better, just like it's illegal to fly an airplane uh, without having the necessary training and the aviation license, right? So uh, a whole host of jobs are, are just going to be taken up by AI, and, and this is why he's speaking of, Harari is speaking of, the rise of the useless class. What do you do with all the useless human beings that AI will inevitably create? And his answer is, no problem, because he's looking at it from a purely evolutionary standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. He says human beings really are fundamentally no different than machines, than AI and robotics technology, because he says, and I'm quoting him, he says, free will is a myth invented by Christian theology. Wow. He goes on to say, this is in his book, Sapiens, he goes on to say that not only is free will a myth, but the notion of human rights is a myth as well. There's no such thing, he says, as human rights, that a human being doesn't have any more rights than a chimpanzee, a hyena, or a spider, he says. And any meaning that we ascribe to life, he goes on to say, is delusional. Life has no actual meaning. So what are we going to do with all the, the useless humans? Well, the first step will be, he suggests, and I think this is a logical move, is that governments will have to uh, implement something called a universal basic income. Because if you have masses of people who, sim he says, aren't just unemployed, but unemployable, there's literally nothing for you to do to contribute to society because your skill level is superseded. So it's, what I'm hearing is it, it would eventually parse out humanity between uh, those that are useful and, and a group that is considered not useful anymore. Yeah, and they would right. become completely dependent. On the government, right? So, so there are, and I don't know if you wanna, we wanna get into this, but, but the development of AI and robotics technology inevitably, if you follow th the trajectory through, um, does have um, aspects of its general philosophy that necessarily moves in the direction of totalitarianism because it will gradually give a smaller and smaller group of elite individuals who control politics and, and the economy control over what human beings do with their lives. We will become increasingly more and more dependent on governments that maintain a monopoly over those technologies. Ty, as I'm hearing this sort of apocalyptic trajectory that we're, we're, <laughs> we're just racing towards, mm. does the Bible address any of this? I think it does. For example, Paul talks about the fact that one of the, the main features of the, the end of the world, the end time scenario of human history, he says perilous times will come that is not a word we use a lot, perilous, just say dangerous. Dangerous. Dangerous times are gonna come. And then he defines what will make those times dangerous. He says, dangerous times will come, colon, men will become lovers of themselves, mm. lovers of money, lovers of, he goes on to describe everything except God. Mm -hmm. So, so what, what's happening is that human beings do not have the moral maturity 
to navigate the technologies that we have the capacity to develop. Edro, Edward O. Olson just died in 2021, Harvard professor, um, biologist. He said the problem with humanity is that we have paleolithic emotions, right? Highly developed institutions, and at the same time, we don't have the moral maturity to navigate what we create. So it's inevitable that human beings will simply move in the direction of what is the best financial bottom line. Men will become lovers of money more than lovers of God, more than lovers of anything. Our times are characterized by a growing, a monolithic corporate economic class that lay hold of anything that produces the greatest financial bottom line for those corporate interests. So it, it's not, in my mind anyway, it's not conceivable that any government on earth will be able to control um, AI or robotics technology. That genie's out of the bottle. Uh, Elon Musk is saying we should control it. We should, we should have laws. Okay, we're gonna create laws and, and the fact is right now, this is how dangerous it is uh, and then we can talk about so, some of the good things about it, I guess. <laughs> but here's how dangerous it is. Right now, if, if you're an 18-year-old girl and you have an Instagram account and you have just one little two-minute video where you're having a conversation, laughing and talking with a, a girlfriend of yours, AI can sample that 18-year-old girl's voice, for example, just off of Instagram and then place a call to her mother or father and say, Mommy, Mommy, I'm in trouble. I just was in a car accident. I need your credit card number. Mm -hmm. immediately right. and mommy's going to give the credit card number because it is the voice of her daughter and yet it is not the voice of her daughter so right. no government is going to be able to ultimately control that and I know criminal organizations are already utilizing that uh, yes even my own mother she got a phone call she from someone who sounded exactly like me you know my voice is out all over the internet yeah, you yeah. Know, they are just messages that are recorded and all sorts of things right she got a call from someone who sounded exactly like me certain mm. mannerisms and but she responded not in English she responded back in Punjabi <laughs> and it hung up so <laughs> she, she calls me uh, I was I was up in Northern California she called me up and she's like she's like are you okay uh, you you just said you were in an accent I'm like mom what are you talking about she's like I, I you just called me and told me you were in an accent and you needed some money right and this she said this <laughs> thing she's like I know your voice and I know your mannerism she said this sounded exactly like you yeah she says but when I began to respond back in Punjabi <laughs> it hung up <laughs> right <laughs> so maybe that's the cure for artificial yeah. intelligence right? yeah. and yeah. if we really want to create intelligent machines mm. we need to think about conscience and conscience is about this sense of what is right what is wrong mm. so since artificial intelligence is trained with data so what will happen if this data has biased so the result will be wrong so in computer science mm. we have a saying that says uh, garbage in garbage out yeah so mm -hmm. you have to be very careful about even your, your ideas, your preconceptions that you have when you are preparing the data and when you are preparing the algorithms, otherwise the artificial intelligence will be so wrong. Mm -hmm. You'll work off it. Yeah. So with this discussion about artificial intelligence, I guess it begs, us, begs this question, what does it mean to truly be human? Okay, so I'd like to, to just combine mm -hmm. two sentences from scripture um, that when you stack them, they reveal the answer to that question. According to Genesis chapter one, verses 26 and 27, the scripture says that God created mankind in his own image, male and female. This is, this is the image of God. And then 1 John chapter four and verse 16 says God is love. God created mankind in his own image, God is love. So when it says that God created man in his own image, I don't think it's saying something like God has two eyes and he made humans with two eyes. God has a nose, he created them with, with a right. physical likeness to himself with a nose. It's saying that human beings were created with the capacity to think and to feel and to choose and to behave in free will patterns of other centeredness. Mm -hmm. God created mankind in his own image, God is love. What is a human being? What distinguishes a human being from AI and robots? A human being is not merely a biological consumption and reproduction machine. The evolutionary worldview, if taken on board, and you've all 
Harari goes that direction, as we just mentioned, reduces a human being to essentially equal in value to machines and AI, because there is no fundamental difference between a human being mm -hmm. and any other form of activity on planet Earth, whether it's man-made or not. So here's the bottom line. A human being isn't merely a biological survival machine. A human being, according to scripture, is an elevated, dignified, noble creature with the capacity to love like God loves. Mm -hmm. So at any point, for example, with AI, I mean, not only are there jobs that are going to be replaced, you know, but wives and husbands, companions and pets are going to be replaced. They just opened in Spain, they just opened the first uh, AI robotics brothel. There's not a single female on the premises. There are robots, there are weddings that are being performed where people are getting married to AI characters. And, and the idea is that, that you will be able to order your own perfect person companion, so to speak, and it'll arrive in your, at your home in a coffin-sized crate, and you'll, crank, you'll, you'll crack that crate open, and a machine will stand up that looks like a human, and you won't ever have to have anybody ever disagree with you again. You won't <laughs> have to go through the, the hard work of building a relationship. The machine, you will simply program the information into the machine that you want to encounter from the machine. You will program the jokes you like, and when the machine tells you a joke, you won't be laughing at the novelty of a human being looking back at you and telling you a joke. The machine will be telling you what you told it to tell you. Right. Mm. So there's nothing to it. Mm. What I'm hearing is that at the end of the day, AI technology will always be slave to its programming. Exactly. It cannot think it, outside of its programming. It is a slave to its programming. But free will sorry. is something that allows us to make decisions to mm. think outside of even what our inclinations and our feelings and our, even That's our right. desires are telling That's us right. That's to right. do the right That's thing right. because it's right, not just because exactly. we do it. Exactly, AI cannot replace the giggle of a little girl with a puppy. Right. AI cannot replace the adventure in a little boy's eyes as he's climbing a mountain. AI cannot replace the deep security and trust that is developed between a daddy and his daughter or his son. Mm -hmm. AI cannot replace any of that. It can and will make uh, give us a run for our money. It can mimic emotional processing. Mm -hmm but it will be just that, it will be mimicry, it will not be actual free will, it'll mimic it because AI has, and it's going to have this capacity with increasing velocity to compute information, AI will be able to pretend to be emotionally present to a person and to mimic emotional processing, just like a narcissistic, you know, psychopath of a friend uh, right. could could pretend to care what you think <laughs> right, in order right. to get the upper hand over you, right? But AI does not have the capacity to love. And you ask, what is a human being? What distinguishes a human being from AI? A human being has the capacity to love like God loves, and that is to say with other-centered orientation that is genuine. Mm -hmm. Wow. Dr. I just, I just read a research uh, paper that talks about um, how we as humans see art generated by artificial intelligence. So in this study, they compare some um, uh, paintings created with artificial intelligence with some paintings created by humans. And for humans, we prefer the human-made art. Mm. There is something, something there, some imperfections, some little things that we think that we appreciate that more than yeah, yeah. what is created. These perfect things that are created with artificial intelligence, say, there is something weird there. All the flaws, mm. the idiosyncrasies, yeah, yeah. Yeah. all the yeah, details, yeah. They, they, at the end there of the day, you can't special. program that. Mm. Uh, Ty, Dr. Alvarez, this has been an amazing discussion. It's been, at times, a terrifying discussion, but it's also been the kind of discussion that helps me to be thankful for being human, yes. right? Well, it's time to go to a break, but when we come back, we'll get to hear some questions from our live audience for our guest tonight. You don't wanna miss this, so don't go away.
Welcome back to Hope at Night. We've been talking with Dr. Harvey Alvarez and Ty Gibson on whether our artificial intelligence will threaten the future of humans. I'd like to turn to our live in-studio audience. We have any questions? Right over there. Hi, thanks for being here. This is fascinating stuff. Um, so I wonder, will the evolution of AI inevitably make humans less intelligent? Intelligence is a very complex um, concept. Uh, intelligence is about creativity. It's about consciousness. Consciousness is this way of getting all this information from our senses and how to crystallize this into ideas. So we don't have this um, knowledge to create machines that can have this level of intelligence. We don't know all this subjective a task that happen in our brains. So if we really want to achieve this level of intelligence, human intelligence, we need to know about the unconscious uh, processes of our brain, and we don't know that. Uh, and we will maybe never know how the brain works because it is a very complicated machine. Dr. Alfred, what you're saying is essentially there's an aspect of our humanity that could never be replicated, duplicated. This idea of the consciousness, its core of who we are, there is, is just something that we mystery. don't even understand. Yeah, right? it's a mystery. Mm. You can ask neuroscientists as well, and they will tell you we don't understand the brain. Right. They just understand some little aspects about the brain, but not too much. Ty, any contribution? Well, th there are aspects of artificial intelligence that any individual human being could depend on and thereby lessen your capacity for computing and processing information. If you walk with crutches, your legs are going to get weak. You know, I could write an essay that involves research and the formulation of sentences on my part regarding, you know, the influence of Friedrich Nietzsche on current academic trends, right? I'm researching that, I'm writing that, or I could just say, hey, could you write that essay for me? No research, no thinking involved on, on my part. But that's merely intellectual intelligence. There's something we know uh, and oftentimes speak of now within, you know, within the last 10 years or so, more so, of emotional intelligence, for example. So you, you, can't, you can't really measure intelligence by sheer RAM or computing power. There's something more to human intelligence that I personally don't think that AI could ever match. Um, there, there are feelings that go into the creation of a essay on Nietzsche that will show up if I write it versus, you know, if, if AI writes it. And so I don't, I, I, I think we could intellectually become more dependent on it and become a little more stupid intellectually, but I don't think that, uh, that it's any threat to our emotional intelligence. In fact, Harari, who says drivers will be replaced, surgeons will be replaced, you know, assembly line workers will be replaced in the job market, he says there is a category of, of job that can never be replaced, counselors, therapists, spiritual guides, those types of things where you sit with a person, look into their eyes, and interact with a human being and empathize. Well, empathy is a form of intelligence. Yeah, right, right. Uh, let me follow up. You know, we have pastors that are currently testing out AI writing their sermons for them. Mm. Uh, we, we've actually seen some churches experiment with AI doing the whole service from everything from yeah. music yeah. Mm -hmm. to, to the, the sermon to the prayer, yeah. right? Are there boundaries we should set within the spiritual realm regarding AI when we say, wait a minute, this is too far? I think those boundaries could only be set privately because you're a person of conscience and high moral ideals. Um, I experimented with it and I, I used AI. I said, hey, would you create a slide presentation on the history of the development of the culinary arts? Right. And in five seconds, an entire beautifully designed <laughs> presentation, slide presentation was created on the history of culinary arts. Yeah, I've never taught it because I, right, I don't right. have an interest in preaching about culinary arts, although I love eating more than almost anything, but it can do it. But I'm not going to write my sermons with AI because I want to own the information as a person and I want to stand before the people and speak 
what I'm convicted about, what I know to be true. And so I think each individual is going to have to govern. It's going to be tempting, though. <laughs> oh, man, it's going to be tempting. Save a little bit of time. And uh, hey, could you just write a sermon for me, AI? You get to that Friday or you know the, the day before that, that sermon is about to preach and you have all week to work on it and you're just going to be tempted just to type in a few words, got your whole sermon ready. I think you could day. use it as a research tool. <laughs> as a research, a research tool, tool yeah, right? To work together. Right. Let's say with ChatGPT, as I already mentioned, uh, ChatGPT uses a lot of data, knowledge from people around the world, yeah? So this is no new knowledge that it is using. Mm. But we as humans, we have this creativity, you know, to create new things, new knowledge, new things that have never done before. So we can do it because we have this capacity. Machines do not have it. Wow. Mm. We have any other questions? Right over there. Thank you. Yes, I'm just fast forwarding a little bit. I'm wondering if on some level, products, ideas, um, art in the future that are actually created just by humans. For example, like you didn't give your wife that poem because it wasn't from you, it was machine generated. Will, will those items actually made by humans, not with artificial intelligence assistance, become more valuable than what is just mass produced by AI? I personally intuitively think the answer to that question is yes. Um, I, I think that human art uh, will actually become more rare and rarity yeah, is the measure of value in, in the world of creativity. And so, you know, if most people begin using AI to paint pictures, for example, um, you know, Bansky might continue painting without AI and his paintings will go up in value, I think. I don't, what do you think? Yeah, and there is an ethical issue behind all this because the art generated by artificial intelligence uh, uses paintings from different other artists. This mm. is not something that just appears like that. No, it gets all this knowledge, you know, get data that we use to train the model. So who is the creator, the author of this painting? Is it the people who created these initial paintings? Mm. Or is it the programmer who programmed the, the, the algorithm yeah. to train the model? Who is the author of all this? So these are open questions. We don't have an answer about that yet. Right, and, and the more accessible it becomes, the less valuable yeah. it becomes because anyone oh, yeah. just put a couple words Very in, cheap. a couple painters in, and boom, they got a, a, an artwork, but that yeah. doesn't have much value yeah, to yeah. it. Correct. Did you see what happened recently with two uh, very lucrative um, pop artists, The Weeknd and Drake? Um, a song was generated by AI, somebody did it, we don't know who did it, but somebody sampled their voices, created a song, and it went up in the charts, it became viral, it was making money for somebody in the record company because their lucrative artists were now being replaced by AI. Um, they had to intervene and say, take that down, get that off the internet. You can't be <laughs> listening to a song by Drake and The Weeknd as a duet that they didn't actually create. So, so the next step for art inevitably is going to be um, AI pop stars. They'll be given names. Yeah. Uh, you'll know, it won't, there won't be any deception. It won't be called Drake or The Weeknd. It'll just be, you know, Billy Bob the pop artist. <laughs> and Billy Bob will, you'll know that that is not a real human, but the songs will be good enough that your favorite artist might become a AI artist. Wow, wow. Well, we might be replaced. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last episode of Hope at Night. <laughs> Let's go do another question, right over there. <clears throat> so I have a lot of friends who are actors. And a number one concern with them is, let's say they're a background actor in a film or television show. And they're scanned with artificial intelligence. Their image is used once. Well, they're scanned once and their image is used many, many, many times, pretty much inevitably for however long they make film, but they're not compensated for it. Yeah. That's, the, that's the issue that they're having with it. So my question is, what do you say to someone, how do you give hope to someone who is in fear that their profession might be lost, that they've worked really hard to achieve because of AI? We're witnessing this right now with the, um, with the Hollywood writers strike, right? Mm -hmm. so, so 
the, the production companies are essentially saying to them in their strike, strike all you want, but you're unnecessary. It, you, can, you can either have the job at the level we want to pay you, or have no job at all because we'll just have scripts written by, by AI. It's, it's a cold, calculated move, but inevitably that's going to happen in not just the writer sector, you know. How do you give hope to somebody? I personally believe very strongly that if a human being is, is a human being's value is determined by what they do to produce income, that that is a very, very limited view of what it means to be a human being. And so inevitably, I'm going to have to define myself the healthy way to define myself and to have hope in this, this hellscape that is descending upon the job market is, is going to be to say, no, 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 I'm a father. That's my primary identity. I'm a husband. That's my primary identity. I'm a follower of Jesus. That's my primary identity. I'm a grandpa. I'm a grandmother. I'm an auntie. I'm an uncle. I'm a friend. So I think one of the positive features of the development of AI is that it's going to inevitably drive human beings to the most foundational existential question. What and who am I? Mm. Am I defined by merely the work I produce or is there something more fundamentally true about me that ascribes value to me? And according to scripture, and this is one of the most blo mind blowing concepts in the Bible, according to scripture, Peter is the author of this idea under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, you were not redeemed with, with perishable things like, like money, gold and silver. You were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. In that text, there is an equivalency of value between the life of God Almighty and the life of a single solitary human being. Wow. God literally values me on the level of his own existence. And that is very hopeful from my perspective. You know, speaking pastorally, how can you have hope? Define yourself as a child of God, as a grandpa, as a mother, as a sister, as a brother, and allow yourself to, to you know, rearrange the mental furniture regarding what it means to be a human being. This is why the scriptures are so important. When you understand the love of God, you begin right. to understand That's who right. you are yeah. in light of That's that. That's right. That's beautiful. Dr. Alvarez? And uh, so we can also strengthen uh, these peculiarities that make us special, different from machines, let's say creativity, mm. soft skills. So we can take steps from now, let's say with our kids, our children, university students, mm. uh, how to do things uh, that can make them much better than these artificial beings. Yeah, mm. right. something people that they skills. Can cannot be uh, duplicated by machines, right? Relational skills, our ability to connect and kindness, For example, humility, yeah. love. Machines do right? not have that. Yeah. Right, fantastic. Any other questions? Right over there. Thank you. Uh, man created artificial intelligence, which, complete, which evolves and keeps evolving over time. How will the definition of good and bad change with the evolving of artificial intelligence? Uh, I believe that that's why we need to have um, a very strong framework, ethical framework, to decide what is good or wrong. Um, I read an article in the MIT Technology Review from the MIT some years ago. They analyzed, for example, uh, one of these uh, software that is being used by the justice system in the United States. Uh, and they found out that this system that is used in order to realize if someone has to go to jail or wait in, in his house or her house for a verdict, uh, they found out that there are big mistakes <laughs> on this system that is currently being used by the justice system. So. It indicates that if these models of artificial intelligence are created with biased, you know, biased data, then the result will be biased. And that's why we need a, a strong framework, ethical framework, in order to realize what's good and bad. Anyone can tell you, okay, this is my, according to myself, according to my ideas, this is right and this is wrong. You know, this is about uh, what we see in, in popular culture nowadays. You have your own truth. 
So who can tell you what was the real truth? Yeah, so we know that according to the Bible, Jesus says, I am the truth. Yeah, so the Bible can give you this uh, north about what to decide in order to say, okay, this is right, this is wrong. Truths in the Bible do not evolve. This is like something that is there, and if we believe it, then we can expect that something good will come from it. Mm. Wow, this is, again, an amazing uh, discussion. And I, and I think we've taken a, just a, a brief look into artificial, artificial intelligence and into our understanding of who we are. What, mm. what has God called us to be? Mm -hmm. Ty, thank you so much. Dr. Alvarez, amazing insights. This has been an interesting discussion. We've covered both the blessings and pitfalls of artificial intelligence, but we've also heard the overall good news that we are not replaceable and that we have a God-given value that far exceeds our mere economic output. And that gives me hope at night. If you have some reflections on what we've been discussing today, we want to hear it. You can do so on our Facebook page at Hope at Night. Also be sure to check out our website at hopetv.org slash hope at night to view any of our past episodes or for more information. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next week on Hope at Night.